20 years ago, a prospect for peace in the Middle East, after decades of conflict between Palestinians and Israelis. This two-part film tells the story of secret negotiations in the political shadows. A story of the search for common ground in the midst of a region in constant turmoil. And at the center of it all, an unlikely mediator. Ladies and gentlemen, His Excellency Johan Holt, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Norway. The His Scandinavian country Amre of Musa, Norway. Minister of Foreign Affairs of Egypt, the Honorable Anthony Lake, Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs. Let us salute also today the government of Norway for its remarkable role in nurturing this agreement. September 1993. Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat shake hands. Hopes were high that peace between Israelis and Palestinians would finally come to the Middle East. But two decades on, such a peace remains as elusive as ever. Oslo lam yatadamman la kilmet inha al ihtilal, inha al istitan, wa la kilmet dawla filistinia mustaqil. Paris wanted to see a Palestinian state in Gaza and an Israeli-Palestinian Jordanian condominium in the West Bank. It is not possible for a small country like Norway to play an asymmetric role. It has to be a role according to Israel's rules of the game. Present at the signing ceremony was former US Secretary of State Henry Kissinger, chief architect of the peace between Egypt and Israel. Kissinger's approach was to make only small demands and to build from there. Arafat picked up on this step-by-step -step strategy, and as early as 1974, his Palestinian Liberation Organization approved a plan to aim for a foothold in the region, administered by a Palestinian authority, rather than historic Palestine. In the same year, the Arab League summit had officially designated the PLO as the sole representative of the Palestinian people. اللي كانوا يسموه وقتها يعني يعطوه كل الألقاب مرة يسموه انتهازية مرة يسموه براغماتية أكثر من اللازم. In 1974, Arafat, known to his colleagues as Abu Amr, addressed the United Nations. For the Palestinians and for the PLO, the event represented recognition for the Palestinian struggle. إنها لمناسبة هامة أن يعود بحث قضية فلسطين إلى هيئة الأمم المتحدة. The PLO gained stature at the UN, but it continued to reject Security Council resolutions 242 and 338. The resolutions demanded that Israel withdraw within what was called secure and recognized borders. But they did not precisely require Israel to withdraw to all land it occupied before the Six-Day War in 1967. As far as the United States is concerned, any uh, peace negotiation must be based on Security Council Resolutions 242 and 338. We would strongly oppose any attempt to change. These two resolutions were the framework for the 1978 Camp David Accords. The Accords called not for a Palestinian state, but for what was termed Palestinian autonomy. Israeli <laughs> 
الذي سوف يتفاوض فيه الإسرائيليون مع الفلسطينيين لإقامة حكم ذاتي. From its stronghold in South Lebanon in 1977, the PLO decided to explore the possibility of talks with Israel. أخذنا أول مرة قرارات بإنه نبدأ حوار ولقاءات مع أطراف إسرائيلية. حقيقة كان أبو عمار يساند هذا التوجه بقوة. وكان في آخرين في قيادة المنظمة بأيدوا مثل هذا التوجه بقوة. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas says in his book The Secret Channels that this dialogue was with the Israeli forces that supported peace and with the Sephardic Jews. In March 1978, Israel invaded South Lebanon. The United Nations responded by deploying a peacekeeping force into South Lebanon. Known as UNIFIL, part of this force was made up of Norwegian troops. I had visited for the first time uh, as part, uh, as, uh, as a Norwegian soldier, uh, visiting the UNIFIL forces in Lebanon. Uh, I came with friends through Israel. The Norsk Bataljon chef took a few days later to the rest of the in Israel. In the Norsk Bevokte Domrode, it has been difficult for the FN Styrkene from the first stund. Grupper av palestinske guerillasoldater har försökt att tränga igenom de norska FN-stillingarna hittills utan särskild hell. Norge contributed approximately 1000 soldiers and of course the security of those soldiers was a very important concern to us. We were one of the first western countries to establish what we described at the time as working contacts. With the PLO in that context, Mr. Knut Friedlund, who was a Minister of Foreign Affairs, Torvald Stoltenberg was the Deputy Minister, State Secretary. He followed the situation very closely at the time. No one is afraid of Norway, and that's the that's the gift. What makes us weak in the traditional meaning is our strength when it comes to serve. The peace. كانت النرويج بلد صهيوني بامتياز بدليل انه من داخل البرلمان بهذاك الوقت كان اعضاء البرلمان 157 عضو 87 عضو منهم كانوا بجمعيه اسمها جمعيه اصدقاء اسرائيل النرويج صدقيني كان اصعب دوله في العالم اصعب من امريكا لاستقبال الفلسطينيين كان في شخصيات موجوده في الحكومه وفي الجيش وفي الاجهزه الامنيه مستعد أن تخدم إسرائيل لا لشيء فقط خدمة لإسرائيل يعني بدون أي مقابل. Norway was more supportive of Israel than many of the others, and I think that than any of the other European states. There are several reasons, reasons, but one of the most important was that the Norwegian Labour Party and the Norwegian Trade Union they saw this. State of Israel as a socialist experiment, uh, almost a kind of social democratic social state uh, like the one we have in Norway. In the late 1970s, there was a common bond of socialist ideology between Norway's Labour Party and its namesake in Israel. One of the key players in this special relationship was a prominent Labour Party member of Norway's parliament, Johan Jürgen Holst. Mr. Holst was the first person at the political level to meet Mr. Arafat. Uh, he was uh, deputy minister and state secretary in, of the Ministry of Defence. He came to Beirut and uh, travelled on to, is uh, to Israel. In July, I think it was, in 79, he met with uh, Yasser Arafat. And Yasser Arafat invited the whole group to a very pleasant dinner. Mr. Holst had very close contact with the Israelis. 
And that, uh, that aspect of Mr. Hoss made him even more interesting to Mr. Arafat. Uh, as, as the, Mr. Arafat's interest in Norway was really over contact with Israel. Det at jeg har fått veltet inn over seg hele konflikten i Midtøsten. Så før man har fått en mer alminnelig løsning på Midtøsten-konflikten, er det vanskelig å se at man skal få en endelig og varig løsning. Vi sodde vi holdt kunt et takket uken. Næib vazir difa og jæa ila Beirut. Vazara muassiset samid, eller at jeg kunne være masul an ha. Hina ma zara kuwatihim il mawjuda fi janub Lubnan. In 1979, the Shah of Iran fled into exile. Israel lost an ally and a major oil supplier. The United States asked Norway to guarantee to sell its North Sea oil to Israel. Concerned about repercussions for its UN troops in Lebanon, Norway sent its diplomat Hans Longva to seek assurances from Arafat. Mr. Arafat, after reflecting only for a few split seconds. He said, I will have no objection to such a Norwegian guarantee to Israel on one condition. When I need a secret back channel to Israel, you provide it. Yasser Arafat wanted the Norwegians to act as intermediary between himself and Israel. Norwegians and the Norwegian government were just shocked to hear the message coming back from Arafat. So from 1979 and every year from there onwards, the Norwegians tried to set up a secret back channel between the PLO and Israel. But Israel were absolutely not willing at all to listen to anything that a Norwegian could uh, come up with from Arafat and the PLO. In 1982, the PLO lost its base in Lebanon. Palestinian fighters were forced to depart following the Israeli invasion of Lebanon three months earlier. A US brokered deal led to Arafat and his entourage moving to Tunisia. It was actually uh, an imitation from Arafat to my predecessor as foreign minister in Finland and uh, myself, I have been defense minister. Uh, and we went in 1982 uh, in, uh, for New Year's Eve with Arafat in Tunis at that time. Arafat asked us directly if we could uh, help him getting a direct contact between PLO and the Israeli Labour Party. And uh, I was at that time uh, a member of the Assembly of the Socialist International. And uh, it turned out to be uh, a strong interest in the Socialist International, for trying to contribute to normalization of uh, the relationship between the Palestinians and the Israelis. To help with his charm offensive, Arafat turned to senior PLO member Issam Satawi to act as his main go-between. Arafat appointed Dr. Sartawi and uh, he came here to visit me because I should take care of this from the Norwegian side. And I had a um, very good impression of him. I believe that the PLO has been the greatest achievement of our suffering people. I believe that the PLO is the most needed object. But a PLO and then we should meet in Albufeira. There was the Socialist International had its assembly meeting in Albufeira in Portugal. And then there was some shooting, suddenly. And we rushed out in the lobby. And there was, um, uh, there was Sartawi, Dr. Sartawi, killed, shot down. Issam Sartawi lay where he'd been killed by a lone gunman who pumped five shots into his chest. 
It has never been clearly verified who ordered the assassination of Satawi. But the motive appears to be because he was talking to the Israelis on Arafat's behalf. Dr. Satawi took his own position. He did swim against the stream in face of great objection and danger. Arafat continued a double game. On the one hand, seeking discreet diplomatic channels to Israel via the Norwegians, while on the other hand, publicly maintaining a revolutionary rhetoric. وبعدين بتطلعوا على معلومات ثانيه، احنا نحن المهم نعطيهم معلومات، رئيس ابو عمار كان يعطيني معلومات باستمرار وكنت اوصلها للخارجيه بعد ما استلم ستولتنبرغ. 20 years on, Torvald Stoltenberg will not betray the secrecy of conversations between the PLO and Israel. We tried to prepare for contact and negotiations. Between the PLO authorities and the Israeli Labour Party, we started there, and we would very much like to try to follow up. Who were the people from the Israeli Labour Party that you were contacting, Mr. Shimon Peres, or no, other people? I, I, I promised never to tell anyone. I have not told anyone, and I'm not even telling you. No, I, I did, um, part of my success in life. This is not coming from what I say, but from all the things I didn't say. In the mid-80s, the Labour Party in Israel formed a coalition government with Yitzhak Shamir's Likud party. Shamir gave a nod and a wink for Likud member Moshe Amarav to hold secret talks with Palestinian politician Faisal al-Husseini in Jerusalem. Discussion centered on PLO recognition of Israel, autonomy on the West Bank, and a federal relationship with Jordan. The so-called Amirav Husseini plan became a model for the subsequent Oslo Accords years later. But all that was soon dwarfed by the outbreak of the First Intifada. A Palestinian uprising which took both Israel and the PLO by surprise. Stop the riot. And let's go. اختصار الانتفاضة الشعبية الأولى جعلت الاحتلال يدخل في مرحلة أنه بدأ يخسر وإسرائيل لا تتحمل الخسارة لا الاقتصادية ولا البشرية ولا الأخلاقية. وعندما يشعر الإسرائيلي أن هناك من يحتل موقع الضحية بدلا منه يفقد صوابه. Palestinian boys throwing stones against Israeli tanks. This David and Goliath contest put the Israelis under great pressure. Time was now of the essence. In an exclusive for Al Jazeera, the Norwegian Foreign Ministry has released highly confidential documents that include a 1988 hand-delivered letter from Foreign Minister Stoltenberg to Israeli Foreign Minister Perez. Stoltenberg wrote that only by relieving itself of the burden of the occupied territories can Israel succeed and prosper. I am ready to talk with any Palestinian that will renounce terror, that will accept 242 and 338 and recognize Israel. Come and negotiate with us. Then you can claim whatever you want. <laughs> القيادة الفلسطينية عملت زفة مصطنعة لكن في الواقع كان ياسر عرفات يريد أن يقول نحن نوافق على القرار 242 بس كيف بده يغلفها إنه بصير عنا دولة 
فعمل دولة في الهواء شايفي قيام دولة فلسطين فوق أرضنا الفلسطينية فوق أرضنا الفلسطينية وعاصمتها القدس الشريف حين توافق قيادة منظمة التحرير على ال242 الذي ظلت تحاربه منذ صدوره في نوفمبر 67 في الواقع شطب كل شيء في القضية الفلسطينية Except all United Nations resolutions including 242 and 338 and uh, I accept the international legality Who is against international legality فبدأ الاقتراب من المجتمع الدولي الذي كان مقاطعا ومواجها لمنظمة التحرير كمنظمة إرهابية بدأ التعامل يختلف In 1988 Sweden mediated between the PLO and the United States A public meeting was held in Stockholm PLO Parliament the Philistine Parliament the PNC had accepted two states Palestine state and Jewish state between bracket Israel in his speech to the UN General Assembly in Geneva in 1988, Arafat formally condemned terrorism. Abu Ammar, in the speech of Geneva, said in a very strange way, I didn't like America. He didn't say that I was going to be the Arab. He said to him, you're going to make a great day in Geneva. And this was, I think, the 14th of the year. وبتقول في الكلام الصريح أنا باسم المنظمة التحرير أعلن عن نبذ الإرهاب بالإنجليزي حتى فبالمؤتمر الصحفي بلش أبو عمار مش عارف كيف بده يقولها فصار يقول أول إشي I announced terrorism فهبوا عليه الصحفيين لا مش هيك As for terrorism I announced it yesterday in no uncertain terms. And yet, I repeat for the record, I repeat for the record that we totally and absolutely renounce all forms of terrorism. All forms of terrorism. Including Arafat had accepted the Israeli terms to start negotiations. I repeat for the record. In December 1988, PLO leader Yasser Arafat, known to his colleagues as Abu Amr, publicly renounced violence. All forms of terrorism. Over the years, Norway had discreetly been talking to the PLO. With Arafat renouncing violence, Norway was now ready to pay him an official visit at the PLO headquarters in Tunis. Tradition made long to got forward to Israel, and in the work we stilled we two crowd to PLO that they should recognize Israel and that they should take a distance from terrorism. They did it, Arafat. It was the first time. Norwegian Foreign Minister visited PLO. It was definitely a successful visit because it was a breakthrough for official contacts. The same Foreign Minister, Torvald Stoltenberg, uh, the father of the Prime Minister of Norway today, uh, he went on a mission uh, to Arafat in Tunis in 1989. And at that meeting, they had a secret part that no one knew about. The Norwegians worked with Arafat on creating a channel of communication between the PLO and Israel, far from public scrutiny. Mr. Arafat's first time he explained how he saw contacts with Israel being established. And the idea of using a Norwegian research institution was the idea of Mr. Yasser Arafat, which he outlined uh, during that meeting. They hadn't 
uh, planned or decided which research institute in Norway, but they they agreed that that would be a good cover, uh, and they also agreed that the um, uh, Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs should pay for it all. That was also agreed in the document. Farfo was a think tank in Oslo founded by the trade unions and connected to Norway's Labour Party. It was chosen by the Norwegian foreign minister as the perfect host for secret talks between Israelis and Palestinians. Its director was Tarja Rod Larsen. He would go on to become a key figure in the negotiations that led to the Oslo Accords. With funding from the Norwegian Foreign Ministry, in 1989, Farfo started to undertake research in the Middle East. Its first study examined the living conditions in the occupied West Bank and Gaza Strip. The living conditions of the that Farfo in the occupied area, which in 1989, the living condition of, of young people growing up under the Intifada. What kind of effect on them? Uh, um, may, maybe more on the sort of mental, psychological effect of, 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 of growing up in such sort of a, a, a violent uh, um, uh, environment. But then it was more a socio-economic study. It, it turned out to because because that was sort of the speciality of uh, of, of, of Fafo. Um, so it, it 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 turned out to be a little more on the sort of yeah more socio-economic. Um, I mean unemployment, all these kinds of indicators of, uh, of social economic uh, life. Mm. So who were the researchers that worked on this project from Norway? Yeah, there were there were uh, there were many, um, and, uh, and uh, one of them that sort of was heading uh, the, uh, the that special service was Marianne Heiberg, who who was the uh, the wife of um, he wasn't at the time, but he later became the Norwegian Foreign Minister Johan Jürgen Holst. I was. I was working in the sort of what we call the, the foreign minister's cabinet or the, or, or the secretariat. Um, my husband was with FAFO. Um, Jan Egland was the state secretary. Mona Yule and I had studied political science in the university. We had been skiing together. We had been to um, university camps together. And her husband, Tairet Larsen, I also knew from his uh, work as an academic and his work in creation of FAFO, the trade union think tank. So these were um, my friends when I became, already when I became uh, uh, the deputy of Torvald Stoltenberg in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It's often difficult for foreigners to understand that Norway is a very, very small country. And the Labour Party has ruled Norway for the most of the post-war period. So you have connections. Uh, you are almost families married together within the Labour Party. Like almost, we sometimes call it the Royal Labour Party because they are like a dynasty. This dynasty was very tight-knit. Foreign Minister Stoltenberg appointed Jan Egeland as his deputy and Mona Yule as Egeland's secretary. She was married to Tarja Rod Larsen, the director of FAFO. Stoltenberg's sister-in-law was Marianne Heiberg, who worked in FAFO. She was married to Defence Minister Johann Jürgen Holst. This made Holst and the Foreign Minister Stoltenberg brothers-in-law. Holst himself later became Foreign Minister. This extended political family became the Norwegian team in the secret Israeli PLO talks. They could use that uh, research institute institution as a as a front for a diplomatic effort to to facilitate peace talks between the two parties and and do that in all secrecy you are very critical about this why i think researchers in uh, should not usually be in a, well take on two hats or be in double roles in tel aviv Another research institute was also acting as a cover for communication between the Israelis and Palestinians. This was the Economic Cooperation Foundation, set up by Israeli Labour Party MP Yussi Balin. 
an NGO that we were leading, Hirschfeld and myself, an NGO which was created earlier by Balin and Hirschfeld, we were able to go between the two sides in Jerusalem and pass messages and come with ideas and even bring the two sides unofficially together under our umbrella of an NGO. I, I was involved with uh, talking to the Palestinian side for many years uh, in a very informal way, mainly with uh, uh, people like Hanan Ashrawi and Faisal Husseini uh, from East Jerusalem and uh, with whom it was easy uh, to talk. By 1989, with the Palestinian Intifada in its second year, there were few signs of hope and peace. Hundreds of Palestinians had been killed and thousands detained. on Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Shamir. The peace process will be composed of two stages. First stage will be an interim, uh, interim uh, conditions, and uh, this will include the full autonomy, etc. The second stage will be direct negotiations without any preconditions between Israel, the Palestinian Arabs, and some Arab countries if they will join the negotiations. We are ready to embark immediately on peace talks. For that purpose, we are ready to hold elections in the administered territories that will produce a democratically chosen representative leadership of the Palestinians. Everything changed in the region when Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1990. The United States led a coalition of nations that retaliated against Iraqi forces. Just two hours ago, Allied air forces began an attack on military targets in Iraq and Kuwait. These attacks continue as I speak. Arafat rejected a military solution to Iraq's invasion of Kuwait. This proved a costly decision. Before the Gulf War, PLO received big financial support from the Arab Gulf states. After the war, because of um, uh, Yasser Arafat's uh, support to Saddam Hussein, that uh, financial support disappeared. They came out of that uh, uh, war very weakened. And I think, frankly, that, uh, that was also one of the reasons why uh, the Israelis were more interested in discussing with them after the Gulf War than before. We, of course, have uh, close relations with the United States of America. With their, with their lie, they are a friend, uh, and uh, we made no secret of the contacts with the PLO, obviously. And we shared some of uh, our assessment based on our communication with PLO with our American friends, yes. In the aftermath of the 1991 Gulf War, the United States and the Soviet Union co-hosted a peace conference in the Spanish capital of Madrid. Uh, we have an opportunity, uh, I think a real opportunity, to see uh, Arabs, Arab states, uh, sitting down face to face in direct negotiations with Israel. Madrid وكل الشروط التي وضعت وضعتها الحكومة الإسرائيلية بقيادة شامير أيامها إنه ممنوع منظمة التحرير تكون ممثلة ويجب أن يكون الوفد هو من الأراضي الفلسطينية المحتلة. أبو عمار ناوى بكل السبل ما نجحناش. كل العرب يا اللي بدوش يانا بده يعزلنا يا اللي بقولنا اقبلوا ووافقوا المهم انه توضعوا قدم في العملية السياسية ان وافق على المشاركة في مؤتمر 
مدريد من خلال وفد فلسطيني أردني مشترك من أجل الوصول إلى مؤتمر السلام لأن هذا هو الأمر الأول الذي يشغل بالنا <تصفيق> For nearly 4,000 years. Haider Abdel Shafi led the Palestinians within the joint Jordanian Palestinian delegation at the talks. Palestinian Jerusalem, the capital of our homeland and future state, defines Palestinian existence, past, present, and future. The settlements must stop now. Territory for, for peace is a travesty when territory for illegal settlement is official Israeli policy and practice. The three-day conference ended with plans for further bilateral and multilateral negotiations between Israel and the Arabs. Documents released after the conference reveal that Shamir thought Madrid a success. and that James Baker said that the U.S. did not support an independent Palestinian state. The Israelis were clear in their actions and actions that they will be able to talk about it for 20 years. It does not mean that the issue is very much. Israelis who celebrated the end of Hanukkah in Washington arrived five days late. An attempt to make it clear to the United States that they're here on their own terms and won't respond to pressure. After Madrid, negotiations moved to Washington, D.C. We sincerely feel that uh, our ideas are uh, fully in conformity with the uh, framework of this process as uh, it was laid ahead. And uh, we speak with a joint Jordanian-Palestinian delegation. Hello, good evening, everybody. We met like we met in the morning, the heads of delegations. We discussed the matter of procedures, and we could not reach yet an agreement. The Israeli government shifted unabashed to the intransigent and openly declared position of claiming all Palestinian territory, not conceding anything for the Palestinians, and refusing to recognize their unity, the unity of the Palestinians inside and outside. الذي كان يسيطر على تفكير حيدر عبد الشافي ليلا نهارا وفي كل مرة اجتمعنا وناقشنا وسمعنا لأحاديث رسمية أو جانبية. الذي كان يسيطر على تفكيره الاستيطان. And the Israelis they were more, more and more angry about this very old, calm, distinguished man talking about settlements. He said, how can we have back Palestine if it's settlements all over? So he had a much more, and, and the delegation there had a much more um, uh, straightforward approach to peace. For the Palestinians, negotiator Haider Abdel Shafi kept the focus of his agenda on one burning issue, the illegal Israeli settlement construction in the occupied Palestinian territories. By 1991, the number of Israeli settlers in the West Bank and Gaza Strip exceeded 100,000. <laughs> الوفد الإسرائيلي في دفع الفلسطينيين في الوفد الرسمي المفاوض إلى المواقف التي يريدها بدأوا يبحثوا عن طرق أخرى. I would say one of the most important messages that we got in our almost daily contacts with Ashawi and Hussein and Usaiba and Ziad and all the Palestinian leaders, if PLO will not be involved, there won't be any progress. And more so, Ashawi and Hussein told us very clear. 
Hanan Shao in Fazil Hussein, they told us something very, very clear. If you would like to have an agreement with the Palestinians, a partner who can make concessions, there's only one address, and this is the PLO. If the Israelis would like to negotiate with the Palestinians, so they must negotiate with the representative of the Palestinians. The representative of the Palestinians is the PLO. If they disqualify the PLO, then they're not going to have any Palestinian to talk to. مفاوضات واشنطن بدأت تدور في الفراغ، وصارت الاجتماعات في واشنطن وكأنها اجتماعات روتينية تقليدية. وفد واشنطن راجع، وفد واشنطن. عايد مرة تاني إلى واشنطن وبدور بنفس الكلام وأيضا فينا بمفاوضات سرية أنه ندخل بطريقة أكثر عملية وجدية مع الإسرائيليين وبالنهاية إذا ما وصلنا لشيء ما في شيء بتسجل علينا يعني لأنه هذه مفاوضات سرية مش ملزمة The PLO again approached Norway to open a new and secret channel with the Israelis. In February of 1992, senior PLO official Ahmed Karaya, known as Abu Ala, travelled to Oslo. Abu Ala came to Sweden and came to Sweden here. We went to the outside and we saw them in the outside. And of course, the same point of view that Abu Ammar wants. Who did you meet in the outside? In the outside, we met with the Minister of the Foreign Affairs, with Stoltenberg. PLO starts to send signals to us here. Abu Ala comes that we, Norway, could become their link to Israel if Israel was interested. Then came Basam Abu Sharif, and he was even more explicit and said, I am talking uh, directly, I have a message straight from the top, Yasser Arafat. Norway should try to do this, uh, and it has to be directly linked uh, with PLO Tunis leadership only. The minutes of their secret meeting in Oslo reveal that Bassam Abu Sharif told the Norwegians that if there were peace, the PLO would influence the Arab world to stop the boycott of Israel. It takes two to tango, we did not have the Israeli side. I had met um, uh, Yishak Rabin before he was elected on one of my missions to, uh, to Israel. On uh, April 1992. In April 1992, we met uh, Rabin. Uh, the, uh, he came for br breakfast in the Norwegian embassy. And he, we asked him, what is your approach to the Palestinian? And he said, I am keen to see some kind of a negotiated settlement. In 1992, the Israeli Labour Party, led by Yitzhak Rabin, won the general election. Rabin continued Israel's policy of settlement building. In public, he spoke optimistically of progress in the peace negotiations. It will be possible to reach an agreement with the Palestinian delegation about the establishment of autonomy. What will be the first and most important task for a government, you and your colleagues? To renew the peace process and to go straight ahead into the autonomy implementation. Shimon Perez was appointed foreign minister. UC Balin, here on the left, was appointed his deputy. And Uri Savir, on the right, their general manager. Balin was given the green light to start the secret direct negotiations with the PLO in Norway. The point about Norway was because Norway was out of the EU, it had independent foreign policy. We had meetings with Terry Larsen and with his people. And we had many, many, many meetings, um, but very little came out of it. But I then started to understand much better the mindset of both parties. Balin actually told uh, the Norwegians that it's good that they will make contact with Hirschfeld, later I joined, in order to facilitate, in order to, that you know, that you'll have like two NGOs, two non-governmental dialogue. This was the, the and we met, Hirschfeld met uh, um, Larsen before, I met him April and later. We found a brother, in a way, a man who thinks very similar to our way of thinking. His wife, 
was the head of the office of the minister and his deputy. And second is the minister and the deputy were very close friends of Larsen, all of them from the Labour Party, all old friends. Mr. Stoltenberg was the foreign minister. I knew him very well and uh, he was very, very enthusiastic about uh, the process. Mr. Stoltenberg met Simon Pieris, who was the uh, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Israel in, in New York at the opening of the General Assembly in September. And in, uh, uh, on the basis of those contacts and follow-up contacts, the uh, Torvald Stoltenberg's assessment was that um, time was ripe to follow up the suggestion of Mr. Arafat. The PLO and Arafat were exactly weak enough so this was exactly the time that the Israelis should choose to start negotiating with PLO outside. PLO before Oslo was almost dead. Israel was the strong power. And Israel decided who to talk to, when to talk, the terms of the negotiations. They told Norway that Norway could like it or dislike it. They could do as Israel said say or go home. A new and self-confident Israeli government and a PLO still cast as outsiders by the world community. They were now on the secret road to the Oslo Accords. But much would need to happen before the diplomatic finale on the White House lawn.